Hey guys, welcome to Make Pods Great Again, a very special edition. My bestie is not here, but my new bestie, Steph Chong, is with us. Steph, how are you? Hello, hello. I'm good. <laughs> it's so weird having a different co-host. You know, Nikki's normally like totally hammered by this time of night, so I don't, I don't know if you have a drink, but you should go get some alcohol and make it feel more normal. <laughs> I should. We had some Trulies in the fridge. I've got some Crystal Light. That's close enough. That that's that, that's basic enough. If you had, if it's pumpkin spice latte flavor, then it's totally Nikki's jam. Had some of that this morning. That's my coffee of choice from like August to November. There you go. All right. Well, we're doing the special edition because it's CrossFit Games Week. I can't believe it. Are you excited? I'm excited. I'm so excited. It crept up on us. I know, didn't it? It like kind of surprised like. I knew it was this weekend. Nikki told me she was going out of town. Like, I'm like, I, I shouldn't have been surprised. And then they started releasing workouts today. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> like, this is really happening. Like, they're really going to do the workouts this weekend. So, I'm pretty pumped. Well, I'm sure it hasn't crept up on any of the athletes that are actually training for this. It's more dragged on because they thought this was happening about six weeks ago or more. So, I'm sure that it's, you know, finally game time. Everyone's ready. They've been ready for a while. You know, it's funny. Um you know, I get the benefit of seeing Saxon every day and all, I'm sure he's just like every other games athlete out there, just like totally obsessing over what the workouts could be and are going to be. And to his credit, he called these, like he was spot freaking on, on most of them. I was really, really? impressed. Like when they started getting released, I'm like, Holy crap, that's exactly what he said it was going to be. Like he, he had kind of walked through what, like what he was preparing for, what he thought it would be. And I mean, of the six that we have, I'm saying he's like four out of six, pretty darn accurate. Wow. You know, that's but, really good. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, you look at the workouts that were released and they're not like revelatory. Oh my God, we've never seen this before workouts. So, you know, I'm not going to give the kid too much credit, but I love him. So I'll give him a little credit. How about that? You um, can get some credit. I mean, getting close, yeah. obviously there's multiple variations you could have done on these benchmarks. And I think anyone who follows along with dot com workouts and anyone who has followed the regionals and games programming in the past can see patterns there, but it's always hard to predict what's going on in Dave's head. So I think that, you know, Rob and I were throwing around some possibilities. Oh, it could be this and oh, it could be that, but you never know until it released. Well, one of the six was on .com yesterday. So that was part of why I got four out of six, but we'll get into that. So let's, <laughs> let's just run through them. So event one, Friendly Fran, and I kind of hate the name because there is nothing friendly about this version of Fran, 21 <laughs> thrusters, 21 chest to bars, three rounds, 115 pounds for the women, 85, or I'm sorry, for the men, 85 pounds for the women. I'm like, I'm kind of nauseous and already coughing just looking at it. What did you, when you saw that as a games athlete, like, what did you think? What were your thoughts? Oh, I love this workout. I love it so much. Do you? I um, hate you. Oh my God. I hated it. <laughs> every, every part of it. I hate. Well, I definitely, I had actually the same thought about it. I said, I don't know what anyone thought was friendly about this. I don't know who named this, but, you know, I like this workout. And I don't think it's a particularly friendly one. Um, I happen to really like heavy thrusters and also chest bar. So it's something that I really enjoy. I, probably more the regular Fran. You know, I'm not a huge fan of light thrusters and chin over bar pull up. So um, this is an exciting one. I think it's going to be really fun. How, what do you think the time domain is going to be for this? Like I, I'm usually pretty good at like figuring out how long it should take. I know normal friends, like what, 45 reps, you know, for each movement and you know, the elite, elite men and women are getting this in the low twos, you know, so you're adding on reps and you're increasing the weight. I mean, how much do you think the time domain is going to go up? I think it's going to go up a little bit. I mean, if you're looking at the elite level, um, yes, the thrusters are a little bit heavier. So you're probably not looking as at, quite a fat, as fast a cycle time as you would on normal Fran, uh, 65 pounds for ladies. Um, and the chest of bar are going to potentially, potentially take a little bit longer. I think that at an elite level, I would expect to probably see those unbroken, um, those 21 unbroken, but I wouldn't be surprised if I did see some strategic breaks there. Um, so I think, I think you're looking at roughly at, double your friend time um of course someone's gonna go and blow that out of the water but yeah if you're looking at low twos i would say you're looking at a four to six minute workout 
I say, I hope it's not double my Fran time because I don't have that kind of time in the gym. Like I got to get back to work. <laughs> I got like, I got stuff to do. Um, well, I remember back, you know, not the, as I was looking at this, it reminded me a little, I mean, we've had so many workouts that we've seen like this over the years, right? And 19.5 is the most recent where we've seen kind of a Fran variation. And in that year, uh, Frazier dominated it, like killed it. He was like 6.53-ish. Um, and I remember he took breaks early. Like I remember watching it and just being like really blown away at, at how methodical he was, where he took his breaks. You know, he didn't come out and try to do 33 unbroken or 27 unbroken. Like he came out and he did, if I'm remembering right, like 15 or 18 and then he broke and then he did another 12 and then he broke, you know? And so I'm wondering if, if, you know, they'll, if all of these will go in and do the same of thinking, all right, I can't do 21, 21, 21. I've got to do 11 and 10 or, you know, 15 and whatever to get through it. If you were going at it, what what would you do? Like, what would be your strategy looking at it to start? Well, this is having said it without, without having done it. So, um, I might do it and then completely refresh my strategy. But I, I do think that in that workout, particularly 19.5, the breaks were super strategic. You, you had to break. Um, and from the beginning. So like I said, I think at the elite level, you expect that 21 chest of our pull-ups is not a feat for most of these athletes. But I do think that given the, the the workout as a whole, I would not be surprised to see some breaking it up. And I think, you know, the conser- conservatively, I, I like chest of our pull-ups. And for me, it would be beneficial to do, you know, two, maybe three sets with super short rest on like the first round or two, just to make sure that you have enough in the tank to really send it home on the last round. So I personally like negative splits. So I would prefer to knock out like a 12 and nine versus, you know, an even split. But yeah, I think it comes down to the, the capacity and the volume and how your chest to bar are when you're out of breath, because those thrusters are going to go fast. You know, it's not a heavy enough thruster that's really going to slow people down. Um, And I wouldn't put the bar down on the thruster unless, you know, you're really saving yourself for those chest bar and that's your limiter. I'm saving myself for tomorrow. I just would just, I'd put the bar down and not come back. I'd just leave. Hey, coach, I'm going to the bathroom. Just take off. It, uh, I just like, it gives, I'm telling you, it gives me nausea looking at this, but I can't wait to watch them do it. Like it, it just lends toward um, this, you know, as much as I, I don't hate to say it, but it'll be a fun to watch. Like this is Frazier's strength, Hepner's strength, like, you know, thrusters and chest to bar. It's going to be fast, strong. The tall athletes are, you know, a little screwed <laughs> to start, the, you know? Yeah, the range of motion uh, is not so friendly to the taller athletes. But, I mean, on the, on the women's side, I think you're going to have many incredible performances. Um, the first that comes to mind, you were mentioning in 19.5, um, Kristen Holta and Sarah Sigmazar did very well that year. Um, I, I, so I think on both sides, we're going to see really impressive performances and it's definitely going to feel a little bit different when people go and try to try to hit this one in their home gyms. That's for sure. Yeah. This will be an interesting one to see. Like I, you know, I think you'll see a, if I had to guess, you'll get a pretty decent separation on the men in event one. I think you'll see a lot of women bunched up if I had to guess. I mean, like there's, you know, the certainly a, a, a wider range of height differences in the men. And I think that range of motion on the thrusters is a disadvantage on a, on that lift. It'll help them in some of these other workouts coming up. So it'll, it'll offset itself, but it will be certainly interesting to watch. Um, And then they roll into event two, 20 minutes to establish a one rep max front squat, big heavy lift to start. That's kind of exciting. Yeah. It's, it's funny when I saw, you know, I actually, didn't think that they were going to do a max lift. We haven't seen one in a long time, at least we've seen them at the games, but we haven't seen one in an online format. And I don't know why I wasn't expecting to see one. Um, but the front squat's an interesting choice. Uh, I mean, you're definitely looking at 
an issue with the thrusters and the front squat. So no matter which one you choose to do first, um, it, let me just say it'll be interesting to see who chooses to do what first, if that is, if they're allowed to do that, if they're allowed to choose the order of events. Um, well, I love it. I love they're doing a front squat. I'm, yeah. I'm praying that one of the athletes waits to like two minutes before go time and ask, uh, ask uh, Castro if it's from the rack or from the floor, just so it feels like a CrossFit gym. That would be so awesome. So much fun. I was looking at some of the men's weights uh, left over from the 2018 games. And so I was doing some math and you're a coach, a games athlete. You tell me if I'm right. So I've always gone under the assumption that front squat should be like, if you have a good front squat in comparison to your back squat, which is what I have stats for typically about 85% is what you're looking at. Give or take. I, I know it's different for some people, but just like kind of on average, if your front squat's about 85% of your back squat, you're, you know, you're doing pretty well. Would that sound about right? Without doing too much of the math on it, that sounds about right. Okay. To me. So, um, as an estimate. Yeah, it's close. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure it's different for others. And I know there are some people out there that are going to blow me up and go, my front squat's heavier than my back squat. Well, then you're screwed up. Um, so uh, just looking at some of the 2018 total. So Frazier and Chandler Smith, or Frazier at the 2018 games reported 485 or recorded 485 for back squat. Uh, Chandler Smith, uh, not in competition, but a self-reported 485. And then you got Jeff Adler at 475, Vellner at 455, BK's 445. So if if that holds true, you should see, you know, several of the men front squat over 400 pounds, which is crazy. That is crazy. You know, I'm thinking someone on the internet might correct me about this um, and say I'm totally off. But I remember someone a long time ago saying that, um, measuring your front squat, your max front squat against your one RM clean. And they said that you should be able to clean whatever your three RM front squat is. So if that changes your, your data analysis, just thinking about it. I think you're right. I think we will see some pretty high numbers on the front squat. And of course it could be much different. You know, if the clean is a, you have to be able to get into that, that proper front squat position to be able to, to stand it up. But if, if you had the data on what these guys are cleaning, which I think we have a little more recent data on, that would be interesting. Yeah, well, I'll, I, I'll pull that tomorrow. Maybe we can do that for the next one, see if we can get a better guess of what it's going to look like when they do it. Um, you know, I was just looking at the, the kind of the quick notes on the back squats, and then the women are just impressive as hell. Uh, Kara Saunders, yeah. 330, Tia, 330. Christy Aramo, 320, Amanda Barnhart, 325. I don't have Laura Horvath, and I wish I did because I feel like hers is going to be way up there uh, amongst that group. But that means you'd have the women front squatting really close to 300 pounds, which, again, is just like, oh, my God. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. That's going to be a fascinating one. I'm really interested to see that event and see how people approach it. Yeah, I agree of with that. Building. Well, it's, and you know, lifting's always mass moves mass. I mean, you always hear that. So I'll be interested to see, like, there is a balance between, you know, being big and strong and you said it earlier, range of motion plays into it as well. Like it is, run squats are hard. Like I have, lo I have long legs. Now I'm not comparing myself to these guys at all. Right. So I, I'm, I bear, I don't do a 400 pound deadlift, so I'm certainly not doing that, but I do have long legs. And so I recognize like, it's harder for me to do a heavy front squat oftentimes compared against other people that I feel stronger than and other things that are slightly have slightly shorter legs than me. So it'll be interesting to watch to see are the athletes that are, you know, strong and, you know, between five, six and five, eight, or the athletes that are big, you know, have a lot of mass. Like I think of uh, Tim Paulson's a great example. He weighs like two ten, about the strongest human I've ever seen. Like just, you know, crazy fit, like all these guys, but super strong. Like I'll be really interested to see how that plays out between someone like that. And then even like a, you know, Laura Horvath that I mentioned, she's significantly bigger than like a Carrie Pierce, who is also very strong. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, kind of how that plays out between the two of them. Right. And the, I, just several of the names that you mentioned who had the highest back squats at, in the total, you know, Tia and Christy, 
you know, relatively small people. So I don't think there's a universal, of course, the saying is mass moves mass, but I don't think right. it's, a, I don't think it's universally exclusive of, you know, bigger people. It'll be really cool to see. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And like, you know, you mentioned Tia, like, I think it was the Rogue Invitational. What did she do? Clean and jerk 270, something like that. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like, just makes me sick. Um, I watched the video this morning, actually. And I'm like, oh my God, like it, it doesn't even look real. Like I watch it and I'm like, this, that can't be real. Like, is this, is this CGI? Like, how can someone that small be that strong? It's just, it's really, really amazing. So it will be interesting to see, like, I mean, the math on hers is a great example her back squat is 330. So her 85% is 280. Well, she just clean and jerk 270. So, you know, and that was like her, her seventh or eighth lift. So yeah, yeah, she'll likely be closer to 300. You would think, I, I don't know. We'll see. It's, it's definitely going to be interesting. I, I mean, I personally don't test maxes very much. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's universal across other elite athletes, if they build it into the program, but I don't max out very much. If, if I do anything, it's, you know, a three rep max, a five rep max. So, um, I am curious to see, to hear if any of the athletes have actually tested this recently. So, cause that's another thing when you go into competition, you know, you have to have a goal in mind of what you think you're going to hit. And that really tells the story of how you're going to build there. So if you have 20 minutes to do it, that's a, that's a pretty appropriate time to find a one RM, you know, at least in the, in the CrossFit world, you know, we're finding a real RM, one RM, I usually take about 30 minutes um, on an Olympic lift, but it will be, the strategy is really interesting to me to, to know everybody's jumps, how much you're resting and how you're really getting to that true max. I love watching the jumps. I love that yeah. so much. I'm going to sit on the couch and eat chicken wings and pizza and <laughs> drink beer and shout at the screen. Oh, don't your jumps too big as I'm sitting there just pounding food in my face. It's going to be so much fun. It's I mean, absolute- that's really, the, that's really the way to do it. There's a, um, I'll tell the story super fast. My, one of my favorite competition story is one of the early days I was competing and it was um, like a two or three RM front squat, something from the rack. And I remember competing and my judge, I didn't know kilograms. I couldn't do the conversion. So my judge was trying to help me out and say like, okay, you're like, you're lifting this, you're lifting that. And he was kind of, I had my strategy, but then I failed a set, one of my heavier ones, but I had time for one more and I added weight and like, he just could not fathom. He's like, you know, you just added, added weight. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he was like, but that's, you know, X, Y, Z pounds in pounds. And you just did this. And went back and forth and was like, you know, you just added weight, like you failed a a rep and you added weight. So that part is like, even people who are judging in person are judgy of how athletes jump. (laughs) Are are you one of those that when you add kilos, it feels like you're adding less because the number is smaller, even though it weighs more? Well, sometimes, but to be honest, I'm always trying to do the math in my head and I'm not good at math as but i know some benchmarks of kg to pounds um but i i couldn't do a number just off i would probably under overestimate it by a little bit so usually when i'm lifting in kilograms if i don't have a plan of like okay i'm putting on the blue the green the the small white one if i don't do that i'm just lifting by feel well so here's my kilogram story so i was um I was training out at uh, CrossFit Mentality, which is Scott Panchek's gym. And uh, we had done Isabel that morning. And so I'd done 30 snatches at 135. And so I felt really good. So I asked the coach, I'm like, hey, can I stick around and test my one rep max? She's like, sure, just go in the other room. There's like a separate room at the gym. So I go in the separate room and I start loading weights on the bar. And at the time, if I'm remembering right, my PR was like 145, right? So I start loading uh, more weight on the bar and I work up to like 155 and Scott comes walking in and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, I just set a PR. He's like, you did. I'm like, yeah, I'm at 155. And he looks at the barbell and he's like, dude, those are kilos. <laughs> and I'm like, are you, I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, you're not at 155. And I think, I think I was at like 167 or something. Yeah. So I was like 12 pounds heavier than I thought. And he's like, go up again. I ended up hitting 180. Like I went from like 155 oh to 180, which was my body weight at the time, you know, because I was using kilos and like in my mind it was lighter, you know, and it, yeah. 
it really showed me like this kind of, I know mind over matter doesn't always work with weights, but there is a real, uh, kind of a, a mental block, I think with a lot of people on these max lifts uh, they think, all right, well, I've never done more than this. So I can't do more than this. That's where I was that day. I will be interested to see with these elite athletes, like in a competition when they're amped up with adrenaline, even though they're not in front of a crowd, they're going to be amped up to see like what they're pushing for. Um, oh, for sure. That, that kilogram story is all too familiar. That <laughs> happens a lot. I thought you were going to say that you picked up and you just did a deadlift no. <laughs> you even loaded it to, to something like crazy. But I mean, that's, it goes to show it's really a, uh, beneficial sometimes to just not know what's on the bar just have someone else load it for you and well and i've never hit that weight since swear to god like i need somebody just to load the bar for me but i need like a, a bar caddy you know like yeah. i've always said we need that like caddies like in golf you need to like hire some teenage kid to load your bar for you or just tip them 20 bucks and you're done it'd be great Perfect. all right event three damn diane i love the name hate the wad <laughs> Uh, three rounds, 15 deadlifts, 315 pounds for the women two or for the men, 205 for the women, 15 strict deficit handstand pushups, uh, two inch deficit for the women, three and a half inch deficit for the men. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we knew it was coming at some point, right? <laughs> Someone knew eventually there was going to be a strict deficit handstand pushup. I guess, man, like three and a half inches for the men, two inches for the women. Don't let me tell you different stuff. That inch and a half's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't warn you up front. Nikki and I say a lot of nasty stuff on this show. Um, so I don't know. Like I was looking at it going, you know, the deadlifts aren't like unusually heavy for the men or the women. That seems like a, I mean, does that feel like a relatively moderate weight for them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, normal Diane for women is 155. So right. um, you're looking at for, for people to get a reference, like 205 was the second bar on the double Diane open workout. So you right. had the, the normal Diane and then you had Diane with uh, the heavier barbell and handstand walking. So um, definitely not insignificant. You know, it's 45 reps, the same rep, total reps as as a Diane. So, um, if you have a memory of that open workout, we did it twice. So you, you had a chance to hit it twice. Um, then that's what that deadlift's going to feel like. I mean, for me, I would most likely not do those deadlifts unbroken. I know for some women that will be, you know, lightweight, but you know, it's not a lightweight. It's not a, an obscenely heavyweight is my analysis. Yeah, like I, I just remember back like Wadapalooza. I was watching the men deadlift. It was the you know they had a, it was burpees and deadlifts. So it was a di totally different wad, but um, you know they were they were heavy like this, like over three hundred pounds. I remember watching Vellner just destroy it, like just absolutely. Yeah. So I'm looking at this going, all right, well this you know this is likely the deadlift portion is really good for him. But then I'm trying to figure out what's the offset. Like when you go into the deficit handstand pushups, like who is with this going to hang up? You know, yeah. It's, that's what I don't know because we I've never seen it before, at least in competition. I've seen plenty of people do handstands. I I do wonder about um about Hepner and his little forearms. I should have messaged him today and asked him <laughs> if he's gonna do this on his fists like he did during the <laughs> open. I know. That's another thing. Anytime I see handstand push-ups, I always wonder about the standard. Um and as far as I can see online, there are not detailed standards that, you know, everyone can see. I'm sure the athletes have gotten them. Um, but I always wonder about the handstand pushups, how, how that will be judged because, you know, there have been, there's been so much controversy over the line, over the box, over, you know, what is locked out, um, different limb lengths and how you can meet that line standard. So the uh, heels over the line standard that is. So I, I do wonder how, how that will be judged and what the what the standard is for how close your hands have to be on those plates on the on that deficit because that makes a huge difference at how far you can be you can have those hands apart and to from totally personal experience I love handstand push-ups I don't love strict handstand push-ups but I'm certainly not terrible at them but when you add a deficit that changes the game almost completely yep. and so I think it will matter a lot how the athletes have a 
the plate set up, you know, how far apart they are, and then what kind of standard they need to hit upon extension. You know, are they trusting the judge to to show that they are have everything in line, you know, head between their arms and they're fully extended, or will they have some kind of a line that they need to get over, which is going to affect the the leaderboard um, immensely. Yeah, I'm kind of dying to see how it's judged. I mean, if it's if if we just said, all right, you take all of that out and just say, like, how does it stack up against their body type? On the men's side, I look at like a Noah Olson, like this is made mm-hmm. for him. You know, mm-hmm. like he's built like a fire plug, like it's just like perfect uh, on both sides. Uh, Frazier, kind of perfect for him. You know, so the first, you know, two of the first three events are just lined up for him to smash, as, assuming you don't have any weird you know, judging things like you mentioned on the women's side, um, you know, again, you know, Tia, you never counter out Sarah could be a good one for her. Uh, Kristen Holta. Um, oh, um, you're going to help me with the name from Australia, New Zealand. Um, Cara. Cara. Yes. Oh. Thank you. God. I'm so sorry. I couldn't remember her name. Like this is yeah, right yeah. up her alley. This would be great for her. Yeah, I think Carl will do really well at this. I think um, Jamie Green. Yeah. We'll we'll have a really good time with this one. It's yeah. it's just going to be interesting, you know. Like you said, we haven't seen the strict deficit. Uh, we've seen a lot of parallel, like deficit parallel hands and pushups, which I think is probably the closest thing that you can equate to these. We've seen a fair amount of those in competition, so. It should now, be an interesting twist. As a coach, like walk me through this real quick. So like anytime I do Diane, um, you know, I'm, we're always coached to, you know, deadlifts, you're coming over. And then when you get to the wall, like if you can do strict, it's ideal because you're unloading your back. Right. And so now they're mm. being forced to do strict. What's that deficit going to do to that from, you know, from their lower backs getting lit up from those heavy deadlifts and now they've got to do deficit. Is it going to affect it at all? That's a really good point. So the answer is yes. Um, If you think about a strict handstand pushup, so especially if you're not particularly strong in them or when you're fatigued, you think about that banana arch position that a lot of people get um, as they start to do handstand pushups, that is really taxing on the back, on the spine. Um, Potentially not the lower back, but definitely the thoracic spine kind of up by your ribs. Speak, just speaking from experience, that's the one thing that's really surprised me on handstand push-ups, especially when you're getting kind of caught in a sticking point and you're stuck in the arch position for a long time. That blows up my back. Um, and I think it's a lot more tension than people anticipate. Of course, if you can stay, you know, perfectly straight up and down and kind of just knock them out, then that's ideal. But I think a lot of people will unfortunately be in kind of compromised position on the strict when they get tired. And that's just putting additional load on your spine in, um, in that spinal extension. Well, I love really the order. Point. I mean, I love the order from event one, event two, and event three. Like you're, you're getting a lot of variety early on. And then event four, man, I got to admit, I did not see this coming, but this was the one that was on the main site, thousand meter row for time. Just a punch in the gut, to be really honest. <laughs> um, but I'm sure all the tall athletes out there are really excited. <laughs> They're like, finally. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, so I looked up the world record times for this. I went onto the Concept2 website to see, like, who are the best in the world, you know, outside of CrossFit. Uh, on the men's side, world record times are anywhere from, like, 240 to 257, so sub three, which is pretty darn fast. And then on the women's side, uh, best in the world was 304 to 311. So, I mean, if you can just conceptualize everyone at home, if you can just conceptualize holding a 130 on the rower for two by 500 meters, like, you know, I think my fastest 500 time, which I have not tested in a long time, but I don't anticipate it would be much faster than it was at that point, was like a 140. And that was me sprinting all out 500. I fell off the rower when I was done and couldn't feel my legs for about 30 minutes. Like that was a max effort. So thinking about sustaining that times two is ridiculous. Um, I don't doubt that we have some people in our community who are capable of doing that and putting themselves in that kind of pain. And so 
you know, here we go. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting. Like, you know, it, it would be easy to say, all right, the, you know, the big, strong, tall athletes are going to blow this one out. I'm not a hundred percent convinced that'll happen, but I will be interested to see, um, you know, who could pull it off. Like, I'm just eyeballing like the women's athletes. Like I'm kind of dying to watch Sam Briggs do this, just dying to see her do it. Like that's her jam end to end. And, and on the men's side, like maybe a Cole Sager or a Tim Paulson who are both like really big dudes, super strong. They're kind of taller than everybody in the field. Um, this could be Fakowski's opportunity to make up for the <laughs> two of the first three that are kind of geared toward the shorter athletes. Like this could be his chance to just blow everybody out of the water. I don't know. I was just going to say, I think Brent, I'm excited to see Brent on this. I don't know how he is on rowing, but this seems like something he would like, especially after you have those first three events that aren't necessarily meant for long limb people. Well, of all, of all these workouts, this is the one I've done before. Now, again, not that I could compare to them, but the only thing I can compare to is the feeling when it was over, like of that, you just go as hard as you can for three to four minutes. Like, you know, I, if I remember right, my time was like three, it was somewhere between 315 and 320. So it was, you know, and I'm decently tall. I'm six feet tall and I got long legs. So I'm an okay rower. But it's the only time I couldn't get out of the clips. Like I was so, like I was so dead. I was trying to roll off the rower and lay on the floor just so I could die in yeah. peace, and I couldn't get out, you know. And so, like, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to watch that pain cave these guys have to go to in the women, because I know like three minutes of an all-out sprint is miserable. Yeah, I mean, it definitely pain cave is the perfect word for it. I, I just. There's no option except to go there. You have to, and it's all mental. Because to be honest, on a rower, yes, you're gonna get more from better technique, but in the end, you just gotta pull. And so when it comes down to it, that last you know, 250, 300 meters, it doesn't look pretty, it's not nice. You're just throwing your body around and you're probably at that point where your nervous system is just shot. But all these athletes are capable of mentally putting themselves there. So it's definitely a, a punch in the gut to finish, finish day one. I tell you the other thing I love about this, that I absolutely love about it. And of course, I remember back uh, the year they did the marathon row. You did that marathon row, right? That was, fun. that was fun for you, right? I remember seeing your face. I remember seeing the video of somebody breaking wind next to you. That was the best part. Um, that'll never there are just away. some moments that you are so glad get. <laughs> just <laughs> crystallize in, in history and and just stay there and that's definitely one of them that was one of the media them team just was on their game that event well, i remember when that event came out everyone said all right matt's done because he's five six and it's a rowing event now there's a significant difference between rowing a full marathon and rowing for three minutes right mm -hmm. but the difference is is like the difference between first and 30th could very likely be two to three seconds. It could be yeah. tenths of a second. Yeah. And so that the, you could you could see someone's entire CrossFit games, whether they make the top five or not, hinge on this event. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that down. Everybody, write that down right now, or just say, "Hey, make wise great again." Said this. I'm telling you, someone's gonna miss the games because of this event. Almost guarantee it. That is a great point. I'll be interested to see if that's the case. I mean, there have been over the history of the open for example the opener regionals there there's been an event that's controversial because they say that it keeps someone who would otherwise be deserving out of the games and i think that um if i'm not misquoting i think the response to it was like well if they missed that event then they didn't deserve to be at the games which you can say whether you agree with that or not but it'll if that is the event out of this first stage of the games we'll have more to talk about yeah well but i think it's gonna be so close you're right it's gonna be a matter of seconds yeah the sure. controversial part will be that you know there'll there'll be a difference between finishing in fifth and 20th will be tenths of a second you know or it could it's potentially could be now you know it may end up being nothing but it is such a sprint and you're talking about the 30 best athletes on the planet in crossfit so all bets are off. It'll, it'll be really interesting to see 
how people line up on this, you know, and for me, like, you know, I look at these first four events and you're like, oh, two of them, hell, three of the first four are really kind of lined up for Frazier to go, all right, I can get some, a real separation in these first three events as the defending champion. And, but that fourth row, like he could be first, he could be 30th. <laughs> like there's a, could be a big separation there. So it'd be interesting to see. It will. I mean, I think you could make the argument. I was, I was actually going to say, I, I love, love, love that they've kept some single modality workouts in there. Um, for example, so the weightlifting front squat, the monostructural row and the gymnastics hands and hold. Yep. Um, it's really reminiscent of 2018 regionals when they had the first three events that were all single modality, uh, each single modality. And I, I, I argue that any one of those could be a reason why someone doesn't make games, you know, because yeah. they are so specialized. But the point of the sport is that you need to be, you know, modestly good in, in all modalities um, rather than necessarily a specialist. So I think you could make the argument that like a front squat will keep someone out of the games or maybe the hand, the freestanding handstand hold that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but it should be fascinating. And I personally, I love that they brought that back. Oh yeah. No, it's exciting. Event five, uh, perfect name, nasty, Nancy. This thing is nasty. From this one end was to aptly end. named. Uh, five yes. rounds, 500 meter run, 15 overhead squats, 185 for the men, 125 for the women, 15 bar facing burpees. I mean, sweet baby Jesus. That's terrible. <sighs> that is so terrible. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I mean, it's just perfect that it's Saturday morning after you just did four events, you're not waking up feeling so chipper. Um, and you have to hit Nancy. <laughs> like that's not, and that's not a very nice version of it. I, my immediate thought is, um, is the overhead squats, you know, they're, they're heavy. Uh, and you're looking at, I specifically am looking at the lower back and upper body fatigue from Diane. Yes. Um, you know, overhead squats, unless you have a really super vertical overhead hold, um, your low back is doing a lot of work there and your core, especially to keep you, keep you upright, keep that bar overhead. And for me, like anytime I do heavy dead, mo even modestly heavy deadlifts under fatigue, like in a workout, my core is just is fried. So that will be really interesting to see how everyone manages that and how their shoulders hold up after those deficit handstand pushups. I was just looking at the the combination of what they do on day one uh, and think for me, I always think tucked position. Like, so anytime I have to get in like any kind of front squat for me, it's a tuck, you know, and I know, yeah, you know, I'm not a coach, so I know that's not the right word. So don't everybody start blowing me up, but you know what I'm saying, right? So you got thrusters, you got the one rep max front squat, then you're doing deadlifts and deficit handstand pushups and that row, like, these guys are going to be wrecked, all of them, men, women, just wrecked. And then you're like, all right, guess what? You get a run today. You get to run a lot today. And you got to do overhead squats. Oh, and there's some burpees in there too, by the way. It's like, oh, and they're bar facing, which is never fun. Um, I didn't have anything to look. Like, <laughs> Thank yeah. God for the burpees. Oh, well, we don't really have anything to judge it on. Like we've got uh, Naughty Nancy from 2013. Uh, none of these athletes except for Sam Briggs – at least to my knowledge, competed in that one. Um, and that was four rounds for time with a 600-meter run, and they were running in that soccer stadium, so they were going uphill. What's interesting on this one is, you know, they're all in their home gym, so everybody's run's different. Yeah. So that, that's certainly a dynamic we've never seen before. Uh, and the overhead squats are significantly heavier. Mm. Like, yeah. you know, at least that year they were um, – now they were doing – rounds of 25 overhead squats at 140 or 95, but that's a big yeah. jump to go to 185, 125. I've, I look at it for the women even more than the men. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a woman, you tell me. Like 125 feels like a really heavy weight for five rounds, 15 overhead squats. How would you break that up? Well, so, so my first thought is that, you know, 2013 was a long time ago. So, it's probably appropriate that they've upped the weight that much sure. in terms of just how the field has progressed. Um, I personally like overhead squats. I have a decent overhead position. That's not, it's a comfortable position for me. So looking at 125, you know, if you're looking at a snap 
for that bar and then just holding on. You know, I, it's, it's so hard to tell, you know, any workout for me with a run, I always pause to think, you know, what's that going to feel like when you get back from the run? I'd like to say that I would do it in one to two sets. I think two is probably realistic, but I mean, you can't ever talk about a single workout like in a weekend like this without talking about what they've done beforehand and how they're feeling. So I think some people will make it look like lightweight and I, I probably wouldn't be surprised if some people just knock this out, but I also, I would be super surprised if the entire field did that. I think you're going to see a lot of breaking in this event, particularly um, just because of the, the fatigue on their core, on their posterior chain, on those overhead squats, it's not insignificant. Where would you put your focus? Is it like, so I, my belief, and again, you're the ex expert here, so correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but my belief is there won't be enough separation in the run for it to matter between all the athletes, it, unless you have somebody that has a much better venue. You know, like if somebody's running uphill versus somebody running flat, you're probably not going to have a gigantic separation. For me, it's like comes down to where, where are you going to be faster, overhead squats or burpees? Like if you're going at it, where are you trying to pick up your time? Yeah, I think in, okay, so if we leave the run out of it, because I think you're right in theory, um, we can get back to why like practicality might not match theory. Uh, I think it's all about the burpees. Um, of course, thinking about the fatigue of everything else, it might be that, you know, my original thought was like, oh, thank God burpees, like might actually be true because they're, you know, just grinding on that barbell. It's five rounds. That's a lot of overhead squats of that weight. So I think it depends on where the limitation is, you know, if like if you can move burpees kind of all day, um, then you're looking at managing those overhead squats as best you can. But I think you can lose a ton of time in just slogging through 15 bar facing burpees. So for me, I think that's where I would focus on keeping the pace and, you know, make it through the overhead squats break before you are forced to. Um, so you can take a very short rest if needed. And then you got to move the burpees. You can lose a ton of time there. I think you could see some smaller athletes do really well in this event. Like I think of like a Carrie Pierce, for instance, who I'm going to make an assumption is a decent runner. I know she'll kill the burpee side of it, kill it, you know? And so your point, if that's where the, you make up the time, she's going to destroy that, like do really, really well. You know, I looked back at 2013. Uh, I didn't have anything to compare on the women's side, but on the men's side, Josh Bridges won that year. He's a much smaller athlete than the other men. So if that holds true, you know, you would think, you know, that there would be a, a kind of a slight advantage, assuming the weight doesn't pin them down. I mean, it's, you know, still a moderately heavy weight. So, yeah, and, this to me, when I looking at it is an engine workout. Um, you know, I look at it as the, the limiter is your engine. That's assuming, and I think this is probably true of most of the field, with no data to back that up, of course, um, is that the overhead squats are a weight that most people, if not fatigued, can move at a decent clip. Right. Um, so, yeah, I look at this and I say it's all about that run and the burpees. Like, what pace are you maintaining on your run? How fast are you moving your burpees and then still able to, to get back out there and run fast? Yeah, you know, I say this every year. I, you know, I don't want to blow his head up and I don't know him. So I guess I'm not really, but Castro is a damn near genius in the way he programs. And like, when you look at this and go, man, you know, you just did three, you know, uh, two really traditional style, three round for time workouts and a, and a one rep max. And then you did a row and now you're throwing in a workout that is just strategy. You know, it's longer than the other. It's significantly longer than all those other workouts are doing. At least I think it will be, you know, yes, it involves a run. So you've got to maintain a proper heart rate. Like if your heart rate gets too high, it's going to kill you on those overhead squats. You can go hard in the burpees, but if you go too hard, you're going to kill your run. Like there's so much strategy here. Um, oh, it's going to be fun. I can't wait. It, it really is. And to, I will completely agree with you. I think that uh, Dave is a really great programmer. And it's, you know, it's testing all levels of 
your abilities as an athlete. So it's not just testing your physical abilities because all these people are super fit. It's like you said, it's testing how well you know yourself, how well you've trained certain adaptations. Um, It's going to catch all the things that you're weak at. It's going to, you know, pull out your weaknesses. And this one is super strategic. And I'm curious how, you know, I don't know many details about how the run is going to be measured and judged and, and all that. So I think that will be an interesting comparison between athletes. Like you said, we're making these assumptions based on the thought that everyone's run course is approximately the same. Um, of course, you think, you know, if someone is doing it in their garage and they have an uphill coming back up the driveway to get back in, um, or say if someone measures, you know, around a curb and has to jump up a curb, or if they're all flat, or if they're going around a track, you know, I suppose they can't do around a track based on the, the out and in, but the idea is that not everyone's surfaces are going to be exactly the same. And so seeing some differences there, I wonder how that will play out in the overall timing of it, because that can make a difference in, you know, five rounds. Oh, it absolutely will make a difference. I just as a fan, like I'm just excited to see it. You know, I have so many favorites, you know, I mean, I love all the athletes, but like, you know, as you get to know people, like, uh, you know, I think on the women's side, like Carrie Pierce and Amanda Barnhart are two of my favorites. They are wildly different body types, you know, and they have different strengths. They're both fantastic athletes, amazing athletes but they're just different, you know, better at different things. And this is one where you kind of test all of it for them. It'll be interesting to me to see who does better in it between the two of them. And same on the men's side, you know, I look at like a Chandler Smith's a good example. Like here's a guy that, you know, he's proven year over year. He's really good in like ruck events and, you know, things that require endurance. Like this could very likely be a fantastic workout for him. It could kill him. (laughs) I don't know. It'll just, it'll be really interesting to see. Um, I agree. And I mean, going back to the the whole idea of programming and how it's done, it, Rob and I talk about this all the time, you know, like programming looks easy um, and it, you know, anyone can write a good workout. I truly believe that, you know, it's like we can write good workouts. We can potentially predict what, the, what good workouts will be, but doing it in a way that they all come together, you know, the program as a whole is more important than any one workout. Yeah. And I think that's, really important to know when for fans when, and spectators when you look at an overall weekend you know I can sit here as a spectator and make all of these assumptions about like oh yeah well of course like the overhead squats are going to be done in two rounds but to be honest unless I do that entire weekend's programming at the intensity these athletes are going at with the same time restraints that they have you know the limitate they have to finish it in a three-hour window that's not enough to recover, you know, an all out effort. So say with any certainty how this is going to feel or what it's going to, what it should look like. Unless I it. so, um, it's really, the beauty in is, is in how it all fits together and how it challenges them in this one weekend. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. And then throwing them into event six. They've never done this oh, before. Right. Max handstand, free, free stand, handstand hold. So the world record on this, I, this is kind of unverified, I guess. I Googled it, like full disclosure. I Googled it right before this video. Some guy named Gordon Lindsay, he's not a CrossFitter, holds the max handstand world record, according to him, of 12 minutes and eight seconds. Dave's given him 20 minutes to do this. So, oh, my. Yeah. So, I mean, think about that. So, you know, this guy's saying he's got the world record at 12 minutes. Have you ever tested this? Have you ever done this for yourself? Not in recent history, not in recent history. Of course, we've done smaller bouts of freestanding hands and hold, but I've never tried for one continuous max. Um, I'm just reading, reading the notes. Um, what, some of the interesting things are that they will have to stay in a four by four box. Um, that's significant because you know, you're, you can walk around, but at some point, you, if you reach the end of your box, you have to walk backwards or turn, Right. which I, you know, for me, I'm like, Oh yeah, four by four boxes, plenty of room, but it's, I don't think it's a given that a lot of athletes can turn on their hands or walk backwards and still stay upright. Um, 
So that four by four could potentially become restrictive, especially under fatigue. Um, they, the time will be over if they leave the box or if they fall to the ground. So touch with their foot or the head. Um, and yeah, and they can get as many, as many attempts in a 20 minute window as they want. Interesting. I, yeah. I, so I think one thing to consider is, um, this is a, a great test of how rigid they've been practicing their gymnastics. So not just can you get work done, but how well can you do it? Which I love to see. Like I'm, you can tell I'm like super excited about this workout, right. this this event, because I think a lot of a lot of the focus often is, you know, what work can you get done? It doesn't really matter how you do it, or it marginally matters how you do it, but just like how fast can you do it? Um, particularly when it comes to handstand walking, you know, there's a lot of people who kind of walk bent over um, in a big arch, um, compensating for other things, and it's going to be really hard to get away with that in this. And you talk about posterior chain fatigue, like it's hard to maintain a bent over position. I don't think I could do it in the handstand for very long. So that is going to majorly limit anyone's time if, if they're not upright in that handstand hold. I'm so interested. There's a couple people I'm really interested to see um, how they do on this because it's just a good one. You know, I, I know we said, you know, any of these could be the reason that someone doesn't go to the games, but I do think we're going to see a lot more gaps here. Oh, all right. So who, who are really they? Excel. Who, who are the two or three you want to see? I know who I want to see. Who do you want to see? <laughs> uh, I really want to see Carrie. Carrie Pierce. Yes. She was on my list. Division yeah, one yeah. gymnastics at the university of Michigan. So this should be right in her wheelhouse. Yeah. Think. I, yeah, no, I'm super excited to see her. Um, I'm really excited to see Danielle Brandon. Yes. She is fantastic on her hands, mm -hmm. um, walking at least. So she's super fast walking and she's got really good endurance um, upside down. I think I can say that because I competed against her at, at Mayhem and it was impressive. She was moving so fast. Um, so I'm excited to see her. I'm also excited. I guess I have more than just three. Um, I'm really excited to see Katrin, um, how she is on her hands. Um, and... Kristen, I think was the other one I'm, I'm excited to see. And Jamie, um, just scrolling through, um, Jamie, uh, Simmons yep. is, yeah. So on the lady side, I think it's going to be really, really cool. Yeah. I had Haley Adams on that list too, just mostly due to size. I, I'm not, I don't know how great she is on her hands, but I know just from like a size perspective, if she is good at gymnastics, she's the right size to do this. Mm. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, how they stack up. And I, I think this is like, Carrie's gotta be like wringing her hands over this one. Like, this is it. This is a great event for her. Like, really it's, good one. You know, it's such a wild card. I say, you know, I say the, those names thinking they're going to, you know, be at the top, but someone could totally come out of the woodwork and be like fantastic on their hands. I have no idea. And that's, I think what's, what's so exciting about this. I think it's a really technical challenge Yep. and I just have no idea how it's going to go. And I think we like to, we like to predict who's going to do well, or, you know, people like to hear who we predict will do well. And I'm going to be so honest. I have an idea from I'm watching, but I don't know who's going to, who's going to take this one. I know I feel bad, like even throwing names out. Cause like, I'm the kind of eyeballing the women's names now. And I'm like, I haven't talked about Danny Spiegel who I love. Like they're saying there's so many events here. She's going to do great at and, and uh, Brooke Wells and Christy Aramo, you know, like mm -hmm. there's so many she'll do well at. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really Danny. any of these, any of the women or men for that matter are really spectacular. I do look at the men and go, this is one on the men's side. Um, like on the women's side, I can pull out 10 names. I'm like, all right, they should be great. This is the men's side. I'm like, I want to, I want to watch Hepner do this because I've made fun of his handstand walks for a long time now. So I want to see if he's worked on it. Um, mostly so I can make fun of him more. And he actually posted something about it today, making fun of himself. So really? it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, um, how he does, you know, but, and, but, you know, kind of the same thing you've got, you know, you got the standards in there, but some of these men are so big, you know, I keep going back to Cole Sager as an example, you know, um, you know, Travis Mayer, 
just kind of eyeballing this BK, Chandler, um, Brent. Like I'm just dying to see how they do on this, you know, and it's, it's the, the benefit of seeing the world's best together when you're like, well, I've just never seen them do it before. So that's what's so exciting to me is like, I, I know they're going to blow me away, all of them. So I agree. I, yeah, I, it, it's wide open. You know, I could be completely wrong in who, who I think will do well. And it's that way for everything. You never know. You know, even if someone on paper could be really good at it, you never know how fatigue is going to catch yeah. up with them going in, going into the weekend and then coming out of day one or even coming out of Nancy, you know, like that's a lot of overhead load. So yeah. it's super fair to say that this one is, I think, wide open and I will be watching very closely because I'm personally super excited about this event. Yeah, I did my top five picks with uh, with Nikki, and now that I've seen the events, I'm like, I kind of want to amend them, but I'm not going to. We'll just uh, we'll let it play out. Um, let's talk about the results. So we've got the pregame on Thursday. Uh, all these times are Pacific time, so Thursday at three thirty Pacific time is when the kickoff is. Um, Sean Woodland and our very own Nikki hashtag Nikki who will be uh, <laughs> will be doing that, and then on Friday it kicks off at noon and uh 6 p.m and then on saturday at 12 and 3 again all pacific time it's my understanding i don't know if you've heard but my understanding is they're gonna run this in waves and then run the video all together so the athletes will have already actually done the workouts we'll just be watching it in arrears which is great we'll get a see it all at once so it's cool stuff it should be very cool it should be very cool i can't believe we get live cross it back live quote unquote hey it's uh It'll be the best sporting event I've seen. I live in Cleveland, so I watched the Browns last weekend, and that's not real sports. So, all right. Well, this was fun. This is good. Yeah, you, we uh, thought we'd do 15 minutes and it's been, what, an hour? <laughs> yeah, close to it, but you killed it. Uh, no one's going to remember who my other co-host was, hashtag Nikki Who. And uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see her with the other bald guy on the update show or whatever the heck they're going to call it. we got to come up with a name for their show. I told her it should be – uh make talking elite fitness great again i don't know if they're gonna pull that off but we'll see but we'll submit some names but anyways it's yes. it's yep. been lovely this is yes. fun lots of fun uh and then for everyone watching we'll get back to you guys as we get uh more information and and certainly give you guys an update after the first events are done so with that steph thanks for joining for everyone watching we appreciate it and we'll chat with you guys soon